Good afternoon. Come on, field players. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Come on, stand up and just shake it off. Shake it off. You're the last speaker. Please, please, just stand up and just shake it off. Okay. I mean, think about it. I go over to California, and um, I've got all these other speakers before me. Think of the pressure. I, I knew six feet tall this morning. <laughs> so now, okay. I really hope this works, or else it's going to be really embarrassing. Um, now, just imagine. I was an underclassman at Penn. So, undeclared major, totally clueless. Just, just look to your left, look to your right. That was me at Penn, early 90s. So, living in the quad, enjoying life. My brother calls me up. And he says, they arrested dad. They charged him with terrorism. The newspapers and the television says he's a terrorist. Now, my father had a role as ambassador for anti-narcotic affairs for the government of Venezuela. His job was drug control policy. His job was to go against drug dealers, big drug kingpins. Many of you might recognize or probably won't recognize this guy. Would you? Is not going to work? Okay. This guy. Now, but you'll definitely, definitely recognize this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Who in the hit HBO show Entourage uh, had a, a huge failure. He bombed in a film called Medellin, where he played Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar was my father's number one enemy while uh, running drug control policy in Venezuela. And you see, what, whereas Escobar was in charge of producing the drugs and trafficking them, he nonetheless had a necessity of laundering the money. He needed to get uh, bankers, insurance agents, and owners of television media and radio media to launder all of his money. And in Venezuela, his number one ally was this handsome guy right here, Orlando Castro. And Orlando Castro was being investigated by my father. And he was very, very upset about these investigations. And uh, so he paid off some judges, paid off the chief of police in Venezuela, uh, exploded a car bomb. Luckily, nobody died. But it was still something very, very dramatic that happened in Venezuela. And my father was put in prison for this. And it was a really horrendous time for my family. And here I was at Penn, uh, trying to do something about this was unthinkable. People said to me, Focus on your studies. Don't worry about this. The lawyers will handle it. Now, I don't know what your opinion is of lawyers, but in my effect, I, I didn't think that they had the capability of saving my father's life. You see, they never intended uh, to have my father go to trial. It took them eight days before they actually produced an arrest warrant. What they wanted was to kill him. They wanted to eliminate him, drag his name through the mud, make him a non-credible witness, and then kill him. So. My uncle and I, my uncle was living in Miami at the time, we, just, we became a team. And from my dorm room, I was able to put together, with the help of a lot of people, a campaign to at least save his life. So we, we recruited all sorts of people. We ended up having Amnesty International involved. We had um, ambassadors, government officials. Slowly the tide started to turn. And with public exposure, it was very, very difficult uh, for them to kill him in prison. Well. After 74 days, a Superior Court judge realized there's absolutely not a shred of evidence against this man. And he was free. Uh, after that, it was very difficult for me not to become involved with the cause of human rights. Uh, you see, the good news is that the bad guys ended up either in prison uh, or, in the case of Pablo Escobar, dead. And uh, uh, which reminds me, you know that rumor that if, you, um, if your roommate dies, you get all A's, right? Well, if your dad's a political prisoner, you also get all A's. <laughs> that was a really good semester for my GPA at Penn. <laughs> After this occurred, I really understood and got a sense of why due process is so important, why equality before the law is so important, why freedom of speech is essential if you're going to talk about human rights violations. So I became a judicial advisor at Penn. At the time, you know, there used to be, I mean, it's gone through several different names. It used to be Student Dispute Resolution Centers, and they used to be trials, then they changed the name to something else, and they used to be hearings. Uh, the point is I became very, very involved with, with student rights. And after I graduated, I, I, got, I stayed in, the, in this idea of civil rights and civil liberties, and I convinced a Penn, a Penn professor 
to uh, start an organization and with a lawyer, together we created something called the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE. And FIRE was a group that focused almost exclusively on uh, student rights on campus and faculty rights on campus. And it was a great time. For five years, uh, we devoted ourselves to defending the free speech rights of students, the due process rights of students. And after a while, uh, it became a little ironic for me. You see, Venezuela elected Hugo Chavez as president. And President Chavez doesn't really have an appreciation for civil liberties and freedom of speech. And so the irony of my life became the fact that I would be defending the free speech rights of students from Cal Berkeley or from Harvard Business School or Yale or Penn. Meanwhile, um, the government of Venezuela was shooting journalists, was putting them in prison. And it, it was kind of like, uh, I, I really need to look more into this. So I became peripherally involved in this by writing a lot of articles. And to me, it was the same thing. Whether it's fighting against the government, a university, anyone that abuses rights, anyone that abuses power, needs to be stopped, needs to be exposed. So, uh, I mean, this is, I guess, where I, where I, uh, where I tell you what happened next. And, and uh, to make a long story short, my mother was shot. My mother was shot in Venezuela by members of the Chavez government. Uh, but I should, I should go back a little bit. Um, I was going down to Venezuela in August for, for a family function, and my mother was there. And this is where, where Venezuela is located. It's actually very close to the United States. It's uh, about an hour and 45 minutes from Miami. And uh, there was an election there in 2004, and my mother got very, very involved because there was a lot of fraud during that election. It was, I mean, this election made what happened in Palm Beach County uh, look like, like, a, a, like a children's playground. Uh, the reality is, there, I was erased from the voting rolls, so I stayed home the day after the election to fill out a whole bunch of forms to complain about what had happened with my vote. And my mother decided to go to a protest, to protest the fraud. I mean, most of the people at this protest uh, were, were people just like this. They were people who were upset about what had happened, and they just wanted to voice their protest. They wanted to voice that they did not agree with the fraud that had been perpetrated. And uh, the government didn't like this, so they sent their militiamen, who usually wear red t-shirts, to try and disperse this crowd. And they were very effective at that, so much so that they then decided to, well, let's really go after them. And they pulled out their weapons, as you see here. Uh, to my astonishment, there was actually a camera live taking taping all of this. And I'm at home, and someone says, turn on the TV, your mother's on TV. And I turn on the TV, and suddenly I see my grandmother, my grandfather, my mother right there in this square in Caracas. And these men pulled out their weapons and began shooting at the crowd. And they shot my mom. Um, so we went from a, a march that initially looked like this to one that looked like that. Uh, a couple people died, many people were injured. Um, I then had to get myself to the hospital. I'm, I'm going to save you the details of what happened. Um, but uh, I see my mother in the, in the uh, emergency room, and they tell me that she will most likely never walk again, and they might have to amputate one of her limbs. Now, I, I can't begin to describe to you the, the level of frustration, bitterness, and how it burns you up inside when you see injustice. Because no matter what kind of injustice you're talking about, it burns you up inside if you have a conscience for that sort of thing. And just like in my father's case, I couldn't believe this was happening. And I decided to do something about it. I decided, let me write about this. And that's kind of how I ended up getting involved with human rights on a more institutional basis. You see, if this happens to you once, you know, your dad ends up as a political prisoner, sorry, kid, life's unfair. If this happens to you twice and your mother gets shot, luckily she survived, it's kind of like the universe saying, uh, Thor, we really want you to focus on this right now. <laughs> and, well, you need a sense of humor for these things, trust me. So, I uh, wanted to create an organization focused on human rights. Now, I don't care where on the political spectrum you're located. I don't care if you're on the left, if you're on the right, if you're a libertarian, an objectivist, a conservative, a liberal. Human rights are indivisible and they are universal. And ultimately, what human rights really means, it's, uh, as far as what we focus on, are the fundamental and basic human rights. So, freedom from torture. Freedom from slavery. A lot of people think, well, wait a second, slavery? Are you kidding? And they have images of the United States in the 19th century and the horrid legacy of the U.S. government and slavery. 
In fact, there's slavery going on right now. There's slavery going on in this hemisphere. There's massive slavery in Africa. The Middle East is, is stinking with slavery. It's all over the place. Human rights also means uh, freedom of speech. It means no one can put you in prison because they don't like what you're saying. It means property rights. And sometimes that gets very complicated and people don't really understand how to define that. Property rights is real simple. It means no one can come and take your stuff. It's that simple. Whether you're rich, whether you're not rich, no one can come and take from you what's yours. Um, freedom from arbitrary detainment. They can't just arrest you for no reason. They can't arrest you because they, they, they have no evidence. They can't arrest you. You all watch the shows. You all watch the TV shows. You all know about the rights and the bail and the technicalities and all that jazz. That's there for a reason. That's due process. Um, freedom to participate in your own government. That means freedom to run for office. You'd be surprised in how many countries people are disqualified from running for office because the government simply doesn't like them. Freedom of religion. Freedom to worship as you wish. Ultimately, th this encompasses what are the fundamental basic human rights. So I figured what better way to put together an organization and avoid the whole bureaucracy, avoid suits, avoid people who just talk academically about this, but in, in essence don't really know much um, because they haven't lived it. So I started recruiting former political prisoners, prisoners of conscience, uh, people who had suffered either under the Nazis, under fascists, under communists. So for instance, um, I was able to recruit Elie Wiesel, Nobel laureate. In fact, I met Elie Wiesel here at Penn when I was a sophomore. That was my, the first contact I had with him. He gave a speech in, in Irvine, and I heard this guy, and this, this guy's a rock star. He survived, he survived the Holocaust and wrote the single best book on the subject in terms of humanizing what had happened during the whole Holocaust. Um, we were able to, this is another example. Paul Ndiazzo, a Buddhist monk, spent 33 years in a prison in Tibet um, and wrote a book about it, uh, The Autobiography of a Tibetan Monk, where he talks about the suffering that China has imposed on the people of Tibet. We were able to recruit Václav Havel, who was uh, president of Czechoslovakia prior to that. He was a poet that essentially brought down communism in that country. And Havel is today our chairman. Why this was so important is, you know, beyond the fact that we, we have on staff, um, or rather on our, our international council, we have more than 100 years of prison experience, so we kind of have the authority to know what we're talking about, um, is, is the fact that our model is to humanize human rights violations. So just like I was telling you about my mother's case and telling you about my father's case and, 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 and confronting you with reality that possibly, I mean, these are someone's mother, someone's daughter, someone's sister, um, and that this could happen to anyone. If, if you really think, what brought down apartheid was not that apartheid was a disgusting um, system that oppressed millions of people based on race. What really brought it down was the fact that they were able to create a symbol of that injustice. And, and that symbol was Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela, uh, everyone knew who he was. There were songs about him. There were prizes granted to him. He was in prison. And 20-something years in prison, uh, he was able to embody the entire suffering of his people. That is when human rights becomes effective. When it's not a bunch of bureaucrats reading statistics. But when you're able to bring it home and say, this is wrong, I cannot look away from this anymore. So we started with the area that, that we had most expertise in, in the case, uh, in that case was Venezuela. Now we've, we've expanded from that, and I'll, I'll go into that. But this was our first case, Francisco Usson. Uh, Mr. Usson uh, committed no crime. He went on Venezuelan television and he gave an interview and made a comment about how he suspected that there were grave violations of human rights going on in Venezuela. Well, the government didn't like that comment, so they tried him in a military court, despite the fact that he was a civilian, and uh, found him guilty of defaming and slandering the armed forces, and gave him five years in prison for that. Um, we took his case, I visited him in prison, uh, they, they did horrible things to him in that prison. And once we started the case, after doing a lot of research and due diligence, the government immediately realized, okay, we can't really defend against this case. See, what these governments do is they hide behind closed doors and they cannot defend in public, internationally, what they do domestically. They are frightened of public exposure. So President Chavez offered him a pardon. Now I'm thinking, score, we got this guy out. 
Well, what did this man do? No, he said. I have done nothing wrong. I have done nothing that requires a pardon. I refuse to accept it. And he served his term until parole. This is the kind of symbol I'm talking about. This is the kind of leader who, who after he's in prison, I'd like to recruit to this cause. Um, luckily, he did get out. He, here we are in, in his house. Uh, that's his wife on the left. Um, it's extraordinary when someone says, I'm free because of you. I'm free because of the work you've done. Now, when he says you, he didn't mean me. He meant my colleagues and everyone involved in this effort. Now, um, we've done other people. This guy was put in prison for making comments about Fidel Castro in Cuba, in Bolivia, and criticizing the president of Bolivia. They decided to deport him. Um, ultimately, we got an asylum in Norway, and uh, he is another symbol. This lady, this is actually part of a poster campaign that we were involved with. She's an indigenous leader in Ecuador, and she mentioned that the president acted like a thug, and she said that on television, and the president of Ecuador ordered her arrested, uh, on charges of terrorism. They always love to use the charge of terrorism because it is a crime so heinous that innocence is actually not a defense. Um, so in her case, we also were able to accomplish her liberation. Um, now, we've done work in Nicaragua, Bolivia, Cuba. We've, we've smuggled hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment into Cuba, into the hands of dissidents. Um, we do that program on an ongoing basis. The government of Cuba really does not like what we're doing there. Um, there, are, there are prices to be paid for this work. Um, luckily, I haven't paid any. This is one of my colleagues in Venezuela. This is Monica Fernandez. The day after the government of Venezuela put her on television and said that she was an enemy of the state, she was shot. In the back, her boyfriend was shot eight times. The government claims it was a robbery that remains unsolved. Why they needed to put eight bullets in her boyfriend is remarkable. What's even more remarkable is they both survived. Um, so there are consequences to this. At the same time, uh, there is lots of negative coverage. This is the president of Ecuador. On TV, he has said that I'm a scoundrel and the Human Rights Foundation is a lapdog of business interests. The president of Bolivia said that uh, to the human, he said this on his May Day address. Uh, it's actually on YouTube. He said, I, you have a choice at the Human Rights Foundation. You can choose prison or expulsion from the country. Um, the, uh, the coverage in, from Cuba is actually the, the funniest of all. Of course, you, if you, they always use the old faithful, CIA. <laughs> so here, the CIA is using an organization called Human Rights Foundation as a front for terrorism and assassination. Um, in a little while, I'll introduce you to all the other CIA agents in my office. <laughs> um, but you do need a sense of humor for this sort of thing. You know, sometimes I, I called a friend last week and I said to him, we've been attacked in four different countries today. And I was really, really upset because it's all lies. And he said, that's really cool. Attacked in four countries? So then, you know, you do need a sense of humor. Um, sometimes, you know, the paid websites are, uh, of, the, of the governments that attack us are, are, are very humorous. Um, this one is one of my particular favorites. Um, and uh, what we've done is we've, we've uh, decided that we needed to network all of these freedom fighters, not just our board, but all of these freedom fighters from across the world. When I say freedom fighters, I mean people who are struggling peacefully to bring about change towards a society that has a respect for individual rights, a tolerant and peaceful society. So we decided, inspired by TED, and inspired by the Davos um, conference that takes place in the World Economic Forum, we created this gathering, and it takes place in, in Norway. And it is uh, really amazing to bring together about 200 people, all of whom have the same tape. Some of them who are legends, um, like, for instance, Lech Walesa from Poland, along with people who are not so well known and are coming up. So we've created this. Uh, you're, you're welcome to come. It's in Oslo next year. We've done it two years in a row. And, and it's kind of like, I mean, the way I like to think of it is kind of like the, the League of Justice. So, so this is a shot. You can't really see well because the lights are, are really high up. But um, this is a shot from inside the theater. Um, this is one of our speakers. This is Kasha Jacqueline. She is currently fighting against laws in Uganda. Uganda has uh, been discussing putting a law forward that makes being gay or lesbian punishable with death. Um, so we brought her to talk about that, what is ultimately a slow motion genocide in the making. 
Now, we also thought it was very important because, you see, the bad guys already have a club, and they get together all the time. You know, they get together, <laughs> they get together at the UN, at the Human Rights Council, for instance. I mean, how is it possible that there's a Human Rights Council that, that includes countries like Libya and Iran, and the, you know, Iran, which, which stones women to death when they commit adultery or are accused of adultery or hang people if they're gay, how it's possible that Iran can be in charge of the Committee for the Advancement of Women is to me the kind of thing that indicates that there is a huge problem. So this is also why we create an alternative to what is otherwise the League of Supervillains. Um, there is, however, a necessity, like I said, for humor. Now, my colleagues are extraordinary. I love going to work every day. They come from all over the world. They're, they're from Drammen, they're from Oslo, they're from Houston, they're from Guatemala, from Bolivia, they're from New York. Um, they are a, an extraordinary collection of people who don't really care about whether we have resources. They care about whether we are resourceful. And they understand, and they come to work every day so juiced up, so prepared to make a difference. And that's really what makes the difference between people who accomplish and people who don't. It's about optimism. You know, what we're doing is virtually unthinkable that we're actually going to succeed at any of this. Yet, when we see the impact that we're having, when we talk to the people who've been impacted by this, it's like filling our tank up with gas. Um, this, this is uh, our, our merry collection of, of what the Cuban government calls CIA agents. Um, <laughs> it's more like, uh, I, mean, I, I don't know if it looks like Rush at St. Elmo's, or <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Um, so what I leave you with is, Elie Wiesel talks about good and evil, and the necessity, the categorical necessity of recognizing evil, that it does exist, and standing against it. And when you see evil organizing, you can see either genocide or human rights violations coming together. You can see. And the moment you see that coming together, the moment it begins, you have to fight it with all of your might. Indifference is not an option. Thank you.